Welcome to this brief session on infectious myositis. In the previous session, we discussed the inflammatory myopathies, disease processes that result in inflammation around the muscle fibers. A subcategory of inflammatory myopathies that is distinct and therefore given its own session is infectious myositis, which is inflammation that results from some sort of biological agent. Many of these you are likely already familiar with as they have multi-system effects that are discussed in other courses. Often the effects of these infections on muscle tissue are overlooked as they are not as consistent as other findings and are also typically not as severe. For this session, which only involves a single segment, we familiarize you with a number of infectious diseases that may result in myositis and consider the workup to assess myositis and treatment options for the conditions you are most likely to see in a clinical setting. Infectious myositis can be acute, occurring as one of the earliest signs of the infection, subacute, occurring at a later time point when compared to other symptoms, or chronic, as an ongoing complication from the infection. Infectious myositis can also be viral, bacterial, or parasitic in nature. The accompanying table provides a partial list of myositis according to infectious agent. For this lecture, we are only going to touch up on the three most likely to be encountered in a clinical setting. Some of the conditions we are overlooking may initially seem surprising. Lyme disease, for example, is endemic to the Northeast United States and discussed in detail in other courses. Lyme myositis, on the other hand, is a relatively rare side effect that is almost never observed in a clinical setting and, if present, is not of much significance to the course of the treatment. Pyomyositis is a direct bacterial infection of skeletal muscle tissue, most commonly caused by Staphylococcus aureus infection. The term pio means pus and reflects the purulent nature of the infection, which commonly leads to abscess formation. The condition is relatively rare, most commonly found as an opportunistic infection in the immunocompromised. Risk factors for developing pyomyositis include strenuous activity and trauma to either muscle tissue or skin. Patients typically present with a similar presentation pattern as that seen for the inflammatory myopathy except that patients are more likely to have fever and a general sense of ill health. Because the disease typically presents as pain within the hip region, it may initially be confused with other conditions, such as septic arthritis of the hip or acute appendicitis if the right psoas is affected. As usual, with cases of unexplained muscle pain and weakness, blood work is typically the first step in making a diagnosis. In the case of pyomyositis, results will be inconclusive. Typical indicators of muscle damage, such as creatine kinase and aldolase, are generally within normal range or only slightly elevated. MRI of affected regions contributes to the diagnosis. Inflamed muscle can be identified through altered signal intensity, and abscesses can be distinguished from the surrounding tissue. If accessible, needle aspiration of the abscess may help to relieve symptoms and be analyzed for identification of the infective agent. The MRI can also help identify muscles from which pathological muscle samples can be biopsied. Histological analysis shows widespread necrosis of fibers within the pathological region, with further analysis identifying neutrophils and lymphocytes as the primary immune cells within the infiltrate. Trichinosis is an example of a parasitic myositis. It's the result of infection with the trichinella tapeworm and is most commonly associated with the consumption of undercooked meat products, with pork being the most common source. Most patients will present with muscle pain, swelling around the eyes due to vasculitis, and fever. Additional symptoms may include double vision due to paraorbital swelling, slurred speech, and difficulty swallowing due to involvement of the muscles of phonation and shortness of breath. When trichinosis is suspected, the patient should be asked about diet, and special attention should be paid to the consumption of pork products. Blood draws will typically identify eosinophilia and possible elevations in creatine kinase, as well as other markers of infection, but will not provide a conclusive diagnosis. Imaging studies provide more definitive evidence, 
with muscle inflammation and calcified lesions in the muscle tissue from old incubation cysts, which demonstrate a puffed rice appearance. Developing cysts in which the head of the tapeworm can be identified may also be seen. In the acute phase of infection, histological analysis may demonstrate necrosis with eosinophilic infiltrates. Later into the infection, encapsulated cysts and associated pathology may also be identified. Occasionally, the larvae or adult worm may also be identified. Muscle myopathy is also a common problem with human immunodeficiency virus. There are two aspects to this relationship. First is primary muscle wasting, referred to as HIV wasting syndrome, in which the patient experiences severe skeletal muscle atrophy. As the disease progresses, the immunocompromised patient becomes susceptible to a number of other conditions, a phenomenon referred to as secondary myopathic syndrome. HIV infection has been shown to induce expression of MHC1 within the muscle tissue, which may trigger T-cell activation and lead to secondary inflammatory myopathy, such as polymyositis. The body is also more susceptible to opportunistic infections, including pyomyositis. As a general rule, whenever a patient presents with acute fever along with muscle pain and weakness, infectious myositis of some form may be suspected. The proximal musculature is most commonly affected, demonstrating a limb girdle distribution pattern, but this is certainly not an exclusive finding. Patient history can assist with ruling out or focusing in on types of infectious diseases. If a patient has been to a tropical area, for example, certain parasites endemic to the region and known to result in myositis should be investigated. Other physical signs may also provide clues, such as the bull's eye sign indicative of Lyme disease, suggesting Lyme myositis. Treatment for the disease is going to be heavily dependent on the specific causes. Antibiotics and antiparasitic medications may help to limit the infection and shorten recovery time. Most forms of infectious myositis will resolve spontaneously with sufficient time and rest. In the case of HIV-related myopathy, highly active antiretroviral therapy has demonstrated success in reducing the symptoms of HIV myopathy. That concludes this session on infectious myositis. In our final session on muscular diseases, we will look at classes of myopathies that result from adverse reaction to chemical compounds, such as venoms and medications. These are the toxic myopathies.